Okay, we have about 20 attendees. And I want to thank all of you for making the time this evening to attend. Um, tonight, we're going to be hearing from uh, Dr. Wayne Seville, and he's a, a master's rower at SDRC. He's a medical oncologist, virologist with an extensive background in pharmaceutical and diagnostics development. Um, he's been um, doing that for 35 years. Uh, he's also uh, worked extensively in uh, areas of basic and clinical virology, including HIV, coronaviruses, and COVID-19. Um, I hope that everyone can hear us. Um, if you can't, please uh, mention something in the Zoom chat. If you have a question for Wayne, uh, please put that in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, Wayne, I'm going to turn this over to you. All right, thanks, Dan. So I'm going to try to make this fairly quick. Um, I've already had some, uh, some questions sent to me. So I'll see if I can address them as I go along, but feel free to add more. And, uh, and uh, Dan will be sorting through them while I'm, I'm talking. Um, so I put together a few slides so you can maybe visualize a little better what's, what's going on. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think we spent a lot of time at the, at the boathouse trying, thinking about COVID-19 just as much as everyone else has. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it's been a difficult time and I think we've spent a lot of time trying to stay ahead of the, uh, the, the problem as well as we can. I think we've been pretty successful. Um, but I think we're, we're moving into a new period of COVID now and I think things are really starting to look, uh, look a little rosier um, with some of these vaccines. Um, I'm going to... Um, I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit about where we are with COVID, some treatments uh, that are available, not too many of them, um, where we are with vaccines, um, how well do they work, how safe are they, um, uh, why, why do you want to get them now, and maybe a couple of uh, spec bits of speculation on, on rowing in the upcoming year. So where are we with COVID? Well, um, we're winning in a bad way. We're now the number one uh, uh, country in terms of number of cases per, per capita, um, way over everyone else at this point. Um, this, is not, this is not a good kind of winning. Uh, we're also uh, just getting to the point where our death rate is actually higher than anyone else right now too, um, which is an especially large problem. Um, at this point, nearly 0.1% of the population of the United States has already died of COVID. So it is a significant issue. Um, it really continues to be a more and more significant issue at this point because rates are really continuing to rise. Our hospitals are getting full, our ICUs are getting full. Um, it's trying to stress the system at this point. This is probably the most, um, I think, in some ways, distressing. Uh, 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 graph I have here. This is the percent of excess mortality in the United States um, uh, by, by date. So if you take the 0% mark is the normal death rate for the United States, everything on this graph is a COVID-related death um, that has happened in addition to the normal death rate. So at one point, we exceeded 40% extra deaths compared to our normal death rate in this country. Um, and I think if you look at the, this graph, it's only to November at this point because deaths are uh, hard to keep up with, take a long time to, to calculate. Um, we're gonna see this again, it's, it's really gonna go up. We are on track for COVID to be the third most common cause of death in this country for the year. So after heart disease and cancer, number three is going to be COVID this year. How are we doing with treatments? Well, not great. Um, the best thing that we've determined is that using immunosuppressive drugs like dex dexamethasone um, can help really sick patients. Um, other drugs that we're 
really uh, thought to be a big issue, a big, a big gain early on, like remdesivir um, and maybe the Reg Regeneron uh, antibody mixture that uh, uh, our president got, uh, really haven't looked as good the more we look at them. Um, I think they're all effective, but these are not curative, uh, real, uh, this is not like penicillin for strep throat. Um, we have made a big difference in the death rate, which is now um, about half of what it was at the very beginning of the epidemic. Um, but that's mostly because we just have got the supportive care, the ICU management, ventilator management down a lot better. There's also been a lot of drugs that people thought might be effective, but have not turned out at all to be effective. Um, hydroxychloroquine uh, falls under that. Ivermectin is a little big, bit bigger now. It's an antiparasitic. Vitamins, um, zinc. Uh, these really have not have no data behind them uh, that suggests they're effective at all. So really, we haven't done very well with treatments. However, the vaccines are here, which is really a big difference. Um, these are very effective, as I'll show you in a bit, and there are a lot of them being developed. Each uh, each spot on this picture uh, represents one vaccine in development som somewhere in the world. Um, and as you can see, many of them are still preclinical, meaning they haven't gone to people yet. But a lot of them are in um, even late stage phase three studies. And now we actually have two of them approved. Um, and some of these are the old fashioned kind of vaccines. Some of them are completely new types that have never been approved before. Um, when you make a vaccine, um, what you're actually aiming for is the part of the virus that really makes uh, a difference to your body. It's the spike protein, the part that binds to receptors and that your immune system sees the best. So you're, what you want to do is have an immune reaction to that spike protein that's on the outside that makes that corona, that halo around the virus if you look at it under an electron microscope. So this um, is really the target of just about everything we do um, in vaccines, um, and it's been the, the target for other uh, diseases also. So how do we get the, the body to make a, a, a response to this? Um, the body uh, uh, really needs to learn about these, this protein um, in advance of being infected with it. So uh, you, your body needs to have sort of combat training um, before it actually sees uh, the, the enemy, this virus. And the way we used to do this, and just about every vaccine that's out there is one of these three types. It's either uh, a virus, the original virus has been weakened. Um, that's like the original polio vaccine. Um, it's been inactivated, like many, many vaccines. Uh, most vaccines tend to be an uh, in inactivated virus. Um, or you can make that protein, like, like the spike protein, in the lab um, and inject that into people, usually with something to augment the immune system. Pretty much every vaccine up until now has been one of those three kinds. Um, but we had a little bit of an advantage here that um, SARS, the predecessor to uh, the virus that causes COVID-19, um, we, we had experience with that about 10 years ago. So several companies tried uh, and labs tried making these newer kinds of vaccines. And so there was so, some experience with them, which sped everything really along really nicely. So where are we now? We have two vaccines that are now uh, approved the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine and the Moderna vac vaccine, which was um, just given the thumbs up by a, uh, the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee yesterday, which means almost always that it will be approved within the next uh, uh, week or so. And then there's a third one that's pretty far along. It's finished, also finished a large trial. Um, this one that was created by uh, uh, University of Oxford and developed um, and produced by AstraZeneca, the, the pharmaceutical company. The first two are called mRNA vaccines, and the second one is a, uh, it's called a vector vaccine or an adenovector, adenovirus vector DNA vaccine. And I'll go over very quickly what those are. It shouldn't, it's, it's less complicated than it looks. 
So for mRNA vaccines, mRNA is the code that in your body is the code for building proteins. So your body takes mRNA and translates it into proteins, and that's how you, you get all the proteins that, that function in your cells. Um, with an mRNA vaccine, you can take that spike protein, the mRNA that codes for it, and stick it inside this, this fat bubble, um, which is called in fancy terms an mRNA lipid nanoparticle. So what you're injecting into someone is basically this mRNA that is coated with fat. And this fat helps it merge with the cell membrane, which is also fat, and get inside. It's like a bubble bumping into another bubble and the two fusing together with the mRNA going into the cell, where the cell's machinery, the, the, your normal machinery for making proteins, um, uh, uh, can translate that into, into uh, the, that COVID spike protein and um, teach your body, your body's immune system to respond to it. So instead of injecting this protein into your body, your body actually makes it inside the cells from that mRNA template and, and your, your immune system reacts to it. So there's lots of, lots of uh, uh, practice with doing this, although it's never been made into an approved vaccine. Um, the AstraZeneca vaccine is very different. Um, it, takes, it takes a bit of the same approach. Um, your, it, takes your, it takes DNA, which your body can also translate into proteins, and sticks it inside a, uh, uh, a cold virus that's from a chimpanzee. So uh, it's a chimpanzee cold virus that's been inactivated. You stick the DNA inside it, you inject it into the body, it, it attaches to your cells, injects the, the DNA into your cells like the mRNA gets into your cells, and then that makes the spike protein. So this is just two ways for your body to make it. Um, I'm not gonna talk very much about the, the AstraZeneca vaccine, although it's been shown to be effective. It's not as effective as uh, the two mRNA vaccines. It's about a 70% effective vaccine. Um, and it's also had some uh, glitches in its, uh, in its development path and its ability to, to get the approved by the FDA. So this one's gonna lag behind the other ones, not, not so much of a, a factor, I think, at this moment. So, do these virus, do these vaccines work? So, the first one was approved a, a couple a week ago, a little over a week ago, was the Pfizer BioNTech one, um, and uh, they did a study looking at um, giving about eighteen thousand people the vaccine and eighteen thousand people saltwater placebo. Um, they didn't know who got it. Uh, the people who analyzed the study didn't know who got it. Um, and what ended up happening is you got this graph that you see on the left. Um, every time you, uh, a patient on the study gets COVID, you get one of those either circles or squares, and it makes the, the, the uh, two lines uh, move up a notch. So as you can see, the placebo arm Keeps, go, keeps going right up just like it started, but the vaccine arm, once you got actually uh, the immune reaction to the vaccine, uh, that, that um, line really almost plateaus. It, very few people get, get COVID in the vaccine arm. Many, many people get it in the placebo arm. And if you look at that inside at the top, you can see those two curves deviate at about 10 days. That's 10 days after the first of two vaccine injections, um, but before the second injection, which happens at day 21. And you would expect your body actually tends to react to these things and get an immune reaction at about 10 days. So this is exactly what you'd expect. The, the two curves start deviating at about 10 days when you get your immune reaction and they keep going apart uh, from then on. Now, the, 
so so this is the the advantage the, this is why the fda has said that they agree that this that a single vaccination probably is effective because you started getting this deviation in the two curves before you got the second dose but to keep that immune reaction going as long as you want it to, uh, you really want that second dose, which is administered with the Pfizer vaccine three weeks later. If you look at the right side, this just shows exactly what happened. So if you can see the blue is the placebo arm and the red is the vaccine arm. Eight people in the vaccine arm got uh, symptomatic you know, COVID-19 where they got sick, compared to 162 people getting, uh, getting it on the placebo. If you look at severe COVID-19, that's ones that required hospitalization and possible uh, admission to a uh, in intensive care unit and putting on a, a, on a ventilator, only one patient got severe COVID-19 and nine got, placebo, got it in the placebo con uh, arm. So the vaccine effect efficacy was 95%. So it prevented 95% of infections. And that's including, uh, you know, the few that they got before uh, the, uh, they, the patients re actually got an immune reaction. Now, the Moderna vaccine the, um, has also been tested, and this data just came out, uh, was presented to the FDA advisory committee yesterday. Um, what you're going to see is it looks almost exactly the same. So the two, the two arms deviate, right, start deviating at about 10 days. Um, in this case, Moderna wants you to get your second vaccination 28 days or four weeks after your, your first vaccination. And um, the vaccine arm only got 11 cases of COVID compared to a 185 in the placebo arm and zero cases of severe COVID compared to 30 in the placebo arm. So a bigger difference there. Um, this is like a colorless term. Children use it freely, and I feel like, we have those cars in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Someone needs to mute their line there. Thank you. So, and, and that's after 14,000 people were injected with the vaccine compared to 14,000 with placebo. So almost exactly the same result, almost exactly the same efficacy. They estimate their efficacy, it, does, it says 9.1 there, that's, it's actually 94.1%. So that, that is basically, those two vaccines are just, are indistinguishable from the efficacy standpoint. They work just as well and they prevent 95% of infections. Side effects, um, I'm just gonna talk about the Pfizer because the Moderna is very similar. The only difference with the Moderna is that there probably was um, a little less, but fewer side effects with the first dose with Moderna uh, and a few more side effects with the second dose on Moderna compared to Pfizer. But basically, they are very similar. And this, uh, this chart shows you the difference between um, what you see with a placebo on the far right, with uh, the typical flu vax that almost everyone gets uh, when they get their annual flu vaccine and the side effects there, the COVID, Pfizer COVID vaccine, and then Shingrix, which is the shingles vaccine that came out about two years ago, um, uh, which is the more effective shingles vaccine for people over the age of 50. Um, a plug for that, please get it if you uh, haven't gotten it already and you're over 50. Um, but it is probably the most, uh, as they call them, reactogenic vaccine, meaning that it stimulates your immune system to react to it more strongly than almost anything else. So that's kind of the poster child for the worst kind of side effects that you can get with a vaccine. And the flu is almost um, indistinguishable from placebo in many ways. Um, except for uh, the possibility of getting uh, pain at the site. So what did the Pfizer vaccine and by reference the Moderna vaccine people get? Most of them got local pain at the injection site. It's kind of irritative and it, it does cause some, some pain there that goes away usually within a few days. Um, it's not severe. Ice, Tylenol, that kind of thing is fine. Um, some redness and swelling occasionally. Um, and then 
uh, over the first couple of days after the infection, some people get uh, mild to, to moderate flu-like symptoms with uh, uh, achy, achy muscles, fatigue, headache, um, although you can see that the headache actually isn't very much different than placebo, um, chills, maybe a low-grade fever. Um, in many ways, it's probably a lot like the Shingrix vaccine, vaccine, which also gives you that, but it's not as bad, and it doesn't usually last as long, and most uh, fewer people actually get it. So those are the big side effects for the, for the Pfizer vaccine and for the Moderna vaccine. Local injection site pain and some mild flu-like illness, mild to moderate flu-like illness for uh, a few hours to at most a couple of days. Um, some people suggest not getting it. Uh, uh, if you get it, uh, you might want to say that you're not going to go to work the next day, but um, you know, I've had I've had the reaction with Shingrix, and it's not too bad. And I wouldn't I would have gone to work <laughs> anyway. It's and it's worse than the Pfizer vaccine. So and then flu is is less. So so that's kind of where it sits. Um, it's not too bad. Uh, it does hurt where you inject it. You can get a little bit sick with it. Um, uh, I believe Ralph, Ralph asked whether uh, he can get it along with Shingrix. I would suggest separating them because they both have the same sort of side effects, you might, it might get worse if you uh, get both. That's not an absolute. Um, your body is used to dealing with all sorts of different uh, uh, of these kinds of bugs uh, it being exposed to that at the same time. It's probably not going to be a dangerous thing, but probably for your own comfort, you might want to do it um, separated out. So long-term side effects is a question everyone has since um, these trials have not gone very long um, at this point. But I don't think this is as big a problem as people think. Um, uh, historically, almost every vaccine side effect um, for vaccines up until now, have, have uh, if you're gonna get a side effect, it occurs within the first week, usually within the first day or two. Um, there are very, very few late side effects with vaccines. In general, most of the su suspected long-term side effects have turned out not to be from vaccines. If you, if you go back, um, the likelihood of getting them is not increased with people that uh, get vaccines, um, including things like um, autism and, um, uh, and uh, 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 neurologic side effects and things like that have generally not turned out to be related to vaccines. Um, in fact, I can't think of a single convincing episode where a late side effect was uh, a problem with any vaccine. Um, and either way, the FDA has mandated a follow-up period of um, these clinical trial patients of at least two years uh, looking for, for problems. Plus they're on the uh, FDA vaccine uh, advent, uh, 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 adverse event uh, registry system. So they'll be collecting uh, uh, ad potential adverse events from these vaccines um, basically forever. Um, the other thing about these, the, these trials is that the, uh, the average patient on these trials has actually been watched for a total of two months already. So um, it's not like these patients have not been watched. These trials have been at least as large as any vaccine trials for previous vaccines. They just happened faster. Um, so uh, I don't think you're getting an untested vaccine. You are not getting a long-term follow-up on these, a very long-term follow-up on these uh, vaccines, but it is very rare for, uh, it seems very rare or even non-existent for them to cause long-term side effects. What are the differences between these vaccines? I've talked about how similar they are, but they are, uh, uh, they have a few differences in part because of how they designed the clinical trials to, 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 to test them. The time between injections is 21 days for the Pfizer. Moderna's two doses, 28 days apart. Um, Pfizer is approved for patients 16 and older. Moderna's 18 and older. Moderna included some pregnant and breastfeeding um, uh, women on their trial, so they have some safety experience with that. So there is, uh, there's been an approval for um, uh, 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 use in uh, pregnant or breastfeeding women, which Pfizer does not have. That's very important because uh, pregnant women 
seem to have a much higher complication and death rate from, uh, from COVID than uh, people of that age who are not pregnant. So these uh, probably, it's very important for, for pregnant women to get uh, vaccinated. Um, there's been a lot of talk about uh, the storage temperature for these. RNA is very, uh, uh, RNA and these, these uh, fat coatings are pretty fragile um, at, high, at higher temperatures. So you really do have to keep them quite frozen uh, when you're shipping them and when you're storing them for long term. Um, they can be stored for uh, at least six months uh, 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 at frozen temperatures. The Pfizer needs to be requ required, it need re is required to be frozen in, in uh, special freezers that go down to 94 degrees Fahrenheit, which are uh, most medical centers have, but uh, they can be tricky to ship. You have to ship it in dry ice. The dry ice cannot go away. These are, there's a lot of uh, effort being placed on the, on the shipping of these two vaccines um, by the FDA and by their manufacturers. Um, they're being shipped in, in dry ice. They're being shipped with uh, temperature measuring devices uh, enclosed in them. Um, I think they will be, it's pretty clear that they will actually arrive frozen. And if they're not frozen when they arrive, uh, or if they've had a period of time when they didn't stay frozen, um, they'll be, it'll be, it'll be known. Um, once you get them and thaw them, if you thaw them in the refrigerator and keep them there, that's the Pfizer is stable for five days, the Moderna is stable for 30 days, so plenty of time to give them. These are multi-dose vials, by the way. Um, and then at room temperature, Pfizer is stable for six hours and Moderna is stable for 12 hours. So you can't leave them sitting out for, for an entire, you probably shouldn't leave them sitting out all day but um, um, they're not, it's not gonna be pretty, particularly difficult to keep them um, uh, in good shape. Um, so why get them? You know, I mean, I think people are, are concerned that there's a risk uh, to getting an, a, a quote, untested vaccine. I, I've tried to tell you how, how I don't think this is an untested vaccine and the, and the risk I think is quite low. Um, uh, how do we, you know, the, the way to minimize COVID-related cases and disabilities, the long-term disability you can get if you get a take case of COVID, um, and, and of course death, um, you know, there's four main attributes that really all four of them are important for, uh, for having the most impact on public health with these vaccines. One is of course vaccine efficacy. You can't get much better, better efficacy than these vaccines. Currently, the most efficacious vaccine that exists is the measles vaccine at 98% efficacy. This is almost that. In fact, you, couldn't, you can't actually distinguish it from a 98% effective vaccine statistically. Um, the other things that are important are rollout speed, which of course the, uh, the, the companies are trying to maximize as much as they possibly can. Uh, I don't think we have any control over that, and um, they are producing vaccines as, uh, at an amazing rate, actually. Um, but the other two things that are very important are the proportion of people vaccinated. Um, the more people vaccinated, the more it protects the people that aren't vaccinated. So the higher we can get the proportion of people vaccinated um, is, is, is really uh, a key a key piece of information for how how we can protect each other. And then transmission rate, this R naught that people talk about, how many, how fast it, uh, it transmits, how many people an infected person can tr transmit it to another person. That's also extremely important um, while we're rolling out these vaccines to keep it low. So you need to keep your masks on, you need to keep out of uh, places that are uh, poorly ventilated, crowded. Um, uh, you, you need to stay away from other people, social distancing. All this remains important um, for the foreseeable future. So don't stop doing it. We're not gonna stop doing it at the boathouse. You shouldn't stop doing it in the rest of your life. And then this, the question of herd immunity, you know, can you get enough uh, immunity in the herd for the, it to stop the whole transmission cycle of this disease. 
people have thought, well, you know, various countries have said, okay, well, if we get everyone infected, we'll, we'll stop it because there won't be any more people to get infected. Well, the, of course, the big down, one of the big downsides to that is that people die of this and people are incapacitated for months with it. Um, that's not a very good thing. It's also almost impossible to get high enough uh, uh, immune immunity through just people contracting disease. One, not enough people get it. Two, um, the immunity dies off after a while. So, so there's always this people cycling in and out of being immune. So you need to probably be at least 70% of the population of a population needs to be uh, immune before you actually uh, get this herd immunity protection. And the only way you can historically do that is with, uh, is with vaccination. Um, we did it with smallpox. We almost did it with polio and measles. Um, um, it can be attained, but we need to get above 70% of the population vaccinated to do that. So I'm just gonna end with a couple of uh, points about uh, how this all affects us at the boat house. Um, you know, our current policies are made to follow the San Diego County guidelines um, very closely, and we're gonna keep them, keep them that way. They really focus on the important part of, of COVID transmission, which is airborne transmission. Um, you know, they can be transmitted by touch and, and transferring things from surfaces to, to your eyes, your face, your nose, um, but it's a smaller proportion of, of things. It's really airborne aerosols and, uh, um, and, and uh, uh, droplet projection from people uh, talking and breathing and breathing hard and yelling and screaming and and all the things that people do uh, uh, that really is a important uh, thing to, re to remember that that's that's probably the most important thing and probably another thing to remember is that a significant proportion of transmission is by people that don't know they're infected um, asymptomatic transmission is from 20 to 80 percent of infection infected cases. So just because you feel okay doesn't mean you're not transmitting it to someone else. We're also pretty closely aligned with U.S. rowing policies. Some have suggested that in fact U.S. rowing got some of their policies from us because we 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 hopped on this uh, pretty early, and I had given a couple of talks uh, to people at U.S. rowing in the past. Um, we're also closely following the CDC recommendations for isolation of quarantine of people uh, that um, uh, 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 people who have been at the boathouse who have turned out to become infected. We've had, uh, at the, as far as I know, four cases um, at the boathouse. There has been no spread. Um, this, uh, this is really, I think, uh, um, a testament to the fact that we've um, really tried to do the science-based approach to preventing transmission between people. Um, we've had an increase in, in membership, and in fact, we're all better scholars for this whole uh, situation. Um, but, you know, what's gonna happen in 2021? Um, I don't think anyone really knows. Case rates need to fall way down. We're at an all-time peak right now. We need to get them very, very low before current disease control measures can be reduced. Um, you know, we're going to really uh, say, I really don't think we're going to see much in the way of changes before summer and possibly later. Um, we're never going to move away from, I think, the San Diego County policies because they are reasonable and because we can um, uh, really get, uh, get a lot of problems if we, if we don't follow them. Um, and there's really too many factors to predict nationals and crew classic at this point. Um, so I think you'll just have to keep watching, see how things develop, um, get your vaccination as soon as you can, um, and keep on uh, wearing the mask and, and um, isolating. So that's uh, what I wanted to talk about tonight. And um, I think uh, if there are any questions, I think we can um, move ahead with them. Um, I do think while, uh, if, if while you're putting in questions, I did get a few questions from a couple of people. Um, uh, Catherine 
had asked about storage requirements. Um, you know, I think I addressed that pretty fully. I think, uh, you know, the, the, the stability of these, these vaccines, once they're thought, is pretty good. I don't, I don't think that this is going to be a big problem. Um, we're going to know if, it, if the shipping, uh, if they weren't kept frozen during shipping um, because of the, uh, the devices that they're using. I think that's pretty straightforward. Um, do I know which populations will receive the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine? Um, I don't know. Um, I think they'll come out as fast as they can come out. I think Moderna is uh, getting ready to, pretty, to um, uh, do these, uh, get their vaccine out pretty well. They don't have the advantage of having Pfizer's massive manufacturing uh, uh, system, um, uh, all their facilities that they have. So it's seems unlikely to me that they can probably get it out as fast as anyone else. But um, which one should you get? Well, I think it's a flip of the coin unless you're pregnant or under the age of 18. Uh, I, think, I think you take the one that you get the first, they're both equally effective. They both have just about the same side effect profile. I don't think there's a reason to pick one over the other. Um, and certainly I don't think that the AstraZeneca vaccine is uh, uh, living up to the other two at this point. Um, and then uh, Becca asked uh, about uh, the spread of uh, what, where, where it came from, where it, uh, was it from the, uh, the wet markets in China? Did it come from uh, animals? Was it, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of questions about this. And I think the answer, the simple answer is that people don't fully understand the wet markets in, in China were Pro may or may not have been the place that it transferred. It probably actually came, uh, came out sooner than that wet market, but the wet market was a very good place for people to uh, um, run into each other and transmit it, be it from person to person. Um, there's some evidence that it came from a, uh, it seems to have come from a bat. It seems closest to bat uh, viral sequence, co coronavirus sequences. There's some questions of whether it came from a very strange looking uh, animal called the pangolin or, or uh, scaly anteater. Um, you know, it clearly can infect mink. It occasionally can infect dogs and cats. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely transmits back and forth between animals more, uh, more, than, uh, more than you typically expect viruses to do. Um, but the CDC and NIH have actually uh, put together a task force to see if they can figure out what the origin of this was and see if we can figure out ways of preventing transfer of this kind of thing in the future. Um, so I think you'll have to wait for that. They've just activated. Um, I think they'll do a pretty thorough job of looking into us. But I think at this point, there's a lot of questions and not fully answered, uh, not all of them answered, especially because the the, the Chinese scientists initially were a little uh, closed handed with their information. Um, and then I, I think also, uh, she also asked about the side effects of the vaccine. I think I covered those. All right, I can take some questions, some additional questions if, if people have them. Um, I would like to give Richard Yoakum uh, the ability to talk. He, may, he pointed out a couple of things and he had a question. Sure. So Richard, you can uh, talk to the whole crowd now, if you enable your microphone. Great, can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you. Right. I just shared on the, um, on the chat that I enrolled in the Moderna trial. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I'm sure I got the vaccine, not the placebo. <laughs> that was several months ago. And, and um, I just want to echo what Wayne said. If, um, when your day comes up, if you're lucky enough, then please get the vaccine. But um, try to plan it on a day where you can take the next one or two days off work um, because you may need that rest as I did. It, it, it wasn't really bad, but I, I was basically pretty much non-functional for about 36 hours. Not, not really uncomfortable, but just really not able to do any work and either physically or cognitively. Yeah, so I think that uh, I think that's that's probably on the on the severe end of the side effect profile, from what I can gather from uh, the clinical trial data that's been uh, available so far. 
um, but it's certainly not uh, a huge surprise either. So I think, uh, yeah, that it's been, it certainly has been suggested that people might want to, uh, you know, plan ahead and not do anything too strenuous for the next day or two after, after the vaccine. Um, I mean, I certainly got the, the Shingrix, at least on paper, looks more severe. Um, and I certainly got some symptoms from it. Um, mine didn't last anywhere quite near that long. Um, but, you know, there's always a wide range between uh, people and how, how long these things, uh, these things last for sure. So, yeah. So thank, thank you, Yoko, uh, Richard, for, uh, for telling us the, uh, uh, the, 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 personal, the personal response. <laughs> uh, Richard also mentioned that FDA authorized Moderna's vaccine for emergency use today. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's right. I did. I did hear that actually. Yeah. The, the, the advisory committee meeting was, was yesterday and it was, uh, uh not a controversial discussion, <laughs> let's say <laughs> neither was Pfizer. They're, they're, this is, you know, this is, this is, a, I think, I think you can't understate just how happy the scientists and the, uh, the companies were to, to get the, the results that they did. By the way, I did want to mention that, um, uh, if, if people hadn't noticed, uh, uh, Dave Ward posted that uh, 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 that um, uh, uh, what's her name, Susan Francia's mother, was one of the pioneering people in developing mRNA vaccines, and was involved uh, uh, um, with with the Pfizer one uh, specifically, but but also uh, was involved with the. It's at an earlier time with the Moderna vaccine too, so. Richard has one last question. Sure. Will it make him a faster rower? <laughs> well, well I can, uh, Dan, can you get, still getting, 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 getting COVID will make you a slower rower for a while, that's for sure. <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, so um, actually my question was, you know, I've, Except for that first 36 hours, I've felt great, no, no long side, no long term side effects. But others may wonder whether getting that alien RNA might cause you to grow additional body appendages, and if that would you make you a faster rower, and then would you be restricted to entering only adaptive rowing events? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's I mean, there's there certainly have been some people asking about whether you know this is going to affect your dna getting these this rna injected into your system and the answer is actually no it's 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 virtually impossible for uh rna to be uh, uh converted back into dna and then have it uh place into your dna um uh, it just doesn't work that way uh that, that's 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 not that your body doesn't really have enzymes for doing that kind of a thing. So so your your DNA is safe from the vaccine. Okay, Tom has a question. Tom, are you still with us? Let me see. Where are you? Tom, there he is. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Hi, Tom. Yeah. Hey. So, hey, Wayne. So. Um, my question is, is, you know, um, uh, with, do we know enough about the vaccine? You know, I mean, I, I understand we have to take two doses, but do we know enough about it that it's going to be like a one-time deal that's, let's say, good for like 10 years, or is it going to be something like the flu vaccine that we take on an annual basis? That's a question that we really can't answer at this point, but I can certainly speculate. So two things. One is that, um, uh, so we don't have long-term data. Um, we have data that goes out to about eight months now, although it hasn't been published. Six, six months is what's been published for these vaccines um, because that's when the first study was done with the first people getting it. And it does very well for six months, as far as we know at this point. People have actually probably better immune responses at six months than they do at a month. So that's good. Um, but likely, the, guy, the most likely thing is that it's likely to not last more than a year or two, uh, is, is people's guess. Uh, and then there's the question about 
you know, the flu vaccine, the reason that you, you have to get the flu vaccine every year is because it mutates enough that what protects you one year is not gonna be the same as what protects you the next year. Now, COVID, coronavirus is actually very similar in many ways to the flu virus in that it mutates at just about the same rate. So far, we haven't seen anything like the important mutations you get with flu virus all the time, despite the fact that it mutates a lot. So it hasn't really changed the virus um, as enough to really make uh, a vaccine that's developed uh, six months ago stop working, uh, you know, six months from now. So the question is really, I think, going to be out there, and I don't think, I don't think we're really going to know. My guess is we're going to probably need it every year or two, um, uh, and it's probably going to be modified every year or so. But it's very easy to modify mRNA vaccines compared to, say, the flu vaccine, and it doesn't take as much lead time. So, uh, so the the short answer is we don't know, but probably you're going to get have to get vaccinated from time to time again. Hey, thanks, Wayne. So yeah, so that was that was my recollection. Like with the flu vaccine, isn't it that like you know a group of physicians need to get ahead, you know, several months ahead of time to make their best guesstimate as to what they think the worst flu vaccines flu is going to be out there, and then start generating it in time and 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 do that. And so you seem, from what I'm understanding, is this probably won't take as much lead time. Uh, for it. You know, actually, the funny thing is that, that the decision about what va flu vaccine to make next year occurs right now. This is when the yeah. FDA is deciding when, what the next flu vaccine is going to be for next year. So but this, this, you know, you can probably, you can probably make a vaccine for it in less than six months, probably four, four months with mRNA technology. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Next up is Chris Shannon. Chris, can you hear us? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Hey, thanks for including those of us not part of um, SDRC. Just a quick question for you. Once we are vaccinated, do we still need to wear masks? Uh, Yes, actually. Um, although there needs to be more work done, it turns out that that uh, a portion of the people that are vaccinated, even though they're protected, seem to shed virus for a while. And we don't really know whether that's infectious virus or not. Um, so I think you're going to need to wear masks for a while. Also, 95% effective isn't 100% effective. So um, it's not quite the same thing. Um, so I would say that masks are going to be used less and less at some point, but I think for the time being, you still need to uh, keep wearing them. Um, there'll, there'll be more information though, I think coming out over the next few months about when, when masks can, can, uh, can, can, can come off. Thanks, Chris. Did that answer your question? Thank you. Certainly glad to have you here. Thanks, Dan. Jackie, you have Hi, a Dan. question. Hi, Dan. Can you hear me? Yes. I was wondering when are children going to be able to be vaccinated? Any idea? No idea whatsoever. Um, you know, the, none of these were tested in, in, in kids. Um, uh, I've heard that there are uh, pediatric trials starting up, but I don't know anything about them at this point. Um, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll take a look into it and see if I can see when these, what the timeline for these trials are. Um, you know, I think, you know, it's, it's uh, they're at less risk, of course, for, for, for bad problems from, from COVID, uh, but they are, uh, certainly a mechanism of spreading the virus. So uh, it, it's a very important question. So I'll see what I can, I can find out about that. 
Uh, Richard mentions that he's read that Moderna has started a pediatric clinical trial about two weeks ago. Yeah, that's that's what I had heard too, but I don't know what the timelines are supposed to be. My guess would be, my guess is that it would take longer to accrue, accrue patients to than this, um, and but although it's probably smaller, uh, my guess is that it's it'll take at least two more months, three more months to get through. Okay, thank you, Jackie. Uh, Kristen, uh, you're up next with your question. Hey, Wayne, thank you for presenting this. It's been fascinating information. I appreciate it. Um, so you've offered the opportunity to participate in a trial. Would you suggest that we take it? Um, well, the trials are over now, actually. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure there's, there's other trials. There's definitely other trials going on at this point. Okay. Um, but these trials are have have all the patients that they need on them. Um, you know, I don't think it's going to be a long wait before there's enough vac vaccine to, um, to 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 inject the rest of us. Um, uh, I, I you know I, I think it certainly prioritized people uh, in nursing homes. Um, uh, um, medical personnel, and then the next group is uh, first responders, uh, and, and uh, several other groups too. But uh, you know, I don't think that there's going to be any. Uh, I, I'm not aware of actually any other trials in the San Diego area either. At this moment, I just got an email from my physician at the um, the Naval Center. Uh, uh. And they requested, and I thought, well, is this something I should try? Because I'm definitely low on the on the totem pole of receiving the vaccine, and I'm not concerned yeah. about it. But I just kind of wondered about what your feeling was. The, about that. The, the the military hospitals are always like on a separate pathway for these kinds of things. <laughs> right. So I, so I never hear about them, but I can I can I can certainly look into it. I don't know what the I don't know what the vaccine is um, that they're testing. So, um, but I can I can take a look and, and shoot you an email about it. That would be great, thank you. Sure. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you. Um, Mary Bush. Hello, how is everybody? Hello, how are you? Hi, um, my question is, will the distribution of the vaccine ensure that the recipient receives both injections from the same manufacturer? Um, and if not, if they receive doses from different manufacturers, will there be any issue? I, uh, well, I can't imagine that it wouldn't, they wouldn't be planning on the, this, giving you the, uh, uh, well, I, I can't imagine they try to, they'd give you a mixed set of vaccines, <laughs> um, just because that's kind of not the way things are usually done. Uh, you know, the, the plan is to actually produce, to, to provide enough vaccines to do the, to do both vaccinations. That's the, that's at least Pfizer's and I'm sure Moderna's um, uh, intent. Now, will there be supply glitches in the whole thing? I wouldn't be shocked if it were, <laughs> but uh, I think each, each uh, vaccination location that I'm aware of is trying to uh, give you a vaccination card uh, and, and keep records there so they know if you haven't come back. Um, you know when you need to come back. Um, and if you are delayed by a week or two, I don't think it's a major issue. These kinds of things aren't so critical for their timing. But I do think it's critical to get the second dose because the immune response is going to be much more long-lived if you get two doses. Yep, that totally makes sense. I really appreciate it. I've just heard some challenges with some of the distribution of the. Product. I'm sure, I'm sure it will. There will be some some problems with this. I mean, it's too big a an effort really for there not to be some problem. But um, yeah. you know, if you if you miss it by a few weeks, uh, I wouldn't worry about it. I think it'll be it'll, okay. it'll work. It's fine. Yeah, I mean, my hope and intent would be that we would all get. The dosage from the same manufacturer, but knowing that mm. we need to do this three weeks ish apart, I just can see glitches with that. So um, it would yeah. be great if, if they would sync up in some manner. But anyway, thank you for all this great information. Sure. Thanks for joining us, Mary. Mm -hmm. um, 
there's a couple comments, Wayne, about the uh, clinical trials for um, for kids. Uh, for, and uh, Richard mentioned in the chat that there's one for Moderna that has 3,000 subjects. Projected completion is June 30th, 2022. Okay. Yeah, yeah from the, that's from clinicaltrials.gov website, the government website that keeps track of all these things. Those numbers are probably fairly accurate at date. Richard also has a more complex question on antibodies and T cells. So um, <laughs> let's see if I can unmute him. There we go. Richard? Yeah. Um, so I, th I think the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines that have been authorized for emergency use both had as secondary endpoints. They're measuring serially antibodies and T cell immunity and I, I read through the briefing documents that FDA prepared for the advisory committee for both of those reviews, and um, I, I don't think they included those data. I was kind of hoping to see them with regard to the question came up about duration of effectiveness of the vaccines. I thought that, you know, seeing what that response was and what the serial decay was might be somewhat predictive for the duration of immunity. Do mm -hmm. you think the data might be used for that and might be available? So I, I would be shocked if it wasn't actually. Um, you know, I've seen a little bit of data from the phase one trial of both of these, um, which have now been published. And, uh, you know, the, they looked at, uh, I think they both looked at immune responses at one month and six months after uh, vaccination. And uh, basically everyone had both antibody and T cell responses at one month, and uh, at least one of the vaccines actually had even better uh, T cell responses at six months. So that bodes well for a fairly long-lived um, vaccination uh, immune result. So, so I'm hopeful, but I think you know this. This is the kind of thing you really need long-term data for, and and the plan is. Uh, I know for from the, I know for both of those the plan is for at least a year follow up, um, and I'm sure they're planning uh, if if they have good immune responses at a year I'm sure they'll they'll keep following it up for longer, so I, I think we'll have that data. It, it's just going to kind of dribble in as time goes on. I can't really hear anything. If someone's asking a question, I can't hear it. Oh, okay. Well, I had a question. It's Sorry, Alexi. Megan. Alexi, wow. Yeah. Hey, what's up? Long time no see. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, lockdown and everything is... Uh, <laughs> uh, my question is this, is that if we get the vaccine, will that affect uh, if we take a COVID test down the road? Because I don't know about you, but I'm planning on doing a few trips once everything opens up. So that's a good question, and there is a little bit of information on this. Um, uh, there may be more than I know about. Uh, it looks like there, well, so, so it looks like some people actually can test positive even after they're vaccinated. And the, my guess would be that, that, that you, can be, um, you, can be, you can be infected but not get a, a, a real COVID syndrome uh, once you've been vaccinated. Uh, people that have been vaccinated can actually get infected but, uh, a little bit, but not actually get uh, full COVID syndrome. I doubt that the vaccine itself is gonna cause you to make enough of the spike protein to show up on any testing. And certainly it's not gonna show up, uh, I really can't, I, I can't imagine that it would show up on a PCR test. Uh, you know, mRNA just doesn't last that long in your body. It, it gets degraded too fast. So, so I think 
The answer is, in most people, probably not. You're not going to be a positive test. You, you might still be able to have a little non transferable infection in the very, very rare person. I was a little surprised to see this in one of the trials. Um, Moderna showed this. Um, so I guess the simple answer is it's, it's extremely unlikely, but not totally impossible. So get our yellow book stamped, I guess, right? Yeah, I think that's good anyway, because you're going to, you know, if you're traveling, you're going to, they're going to want to see it anyway, probably <laughs> in some places. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks. Thank you, Alexi. And Jerry Jessup has a good question here. Hey, Wayne. Uh, Another person I haven't seen in a while. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully I'll be down at the boathouse, but I sure appreciate your presentation this evening. Thank you very much. Um, I, you know, I've been curious. Uh, there was a couple books on the uh, Spanish flu uh, hmm. 1918 epidemic and, and how they've been struggling to find a vaccine for the flu because it does tend to mutate over time. Um, is the COVID vaccine an M? RNA type vaccine, a new type of vaccine? And would that type of vaccine be suitable for the flu? Uh, potentially, yeah, I think, I think that's uh, it's a definite possibility. Um, you know, there's several different kinds of flu vaccine. Uh, none of them are mRNA vaccines, but uh, you know, I think now that there's been success with this, uh, it's, it's good. I think if it's a vaccine you wanna get every year, you may not wanna get flu-like symptoms every time, of course, but, um, but uh, uh, you know, I, I, I'm kind of hoping, you know, I would have thought at the beginning that it would mutate as much as the flu. It hasn't, you know, really been that big of a problem. There aren't, there aren't strains in part, parts of the world that are particularly different than strains in, in you know, in, that are closer to home. So, uh, you know, whether, whether it's just, it mutates, but it just doesn't mutate in a way that changes the virus enough to make a difference or, or what, uh, I don't know. It, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's a, it's just a little too hard, too early to tell since we only have a year's worth of experience with this virus. Um, but it, it certainly looks easier to keep up with than the flu virus so far. All right. Thank you very much. Wayne, I was asked a question offline by someone. Uh, if um, what 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 happens when you know, especially at the boathouse, when some people are early in the queue to get the vaccine and other people are not early in the queue to get the vaccine, what 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 um, what does the science tell us we should do? We should keep. We should keep our masks on and keep isolating, I think is the answer. Um, you know, like I said, there, there, when, when I talked about those four factors that really affects how, how effective the vaccine is going to be in preventing a lot of cases and deaths, um, that comes from a modeling study that's a really interesting modeling study that someone did uh, about uh, three or four weeks ago. And, Probably if you were to rate all four of those things, probably the most important factor is keeping transmissibility low. So keeping, keeping things under control as well as possible um, while everyone is getting the vaccine. So don't do anything different when, if, you've got a vac if you're vaccinated or not vaccinated. Um, I think you can feel a little more comfortable that you're less likely to get uh, a dangerous case of COVID, but I think for everyone else and and for yourself, you should keep on isolating until we decide um, more generally that that uh, some of these disease control methods are um, should be should be discontinued. If nothing else, you'll be you know not scaring other people by walking around without a mask. I don't see any other questions. Uh, we certainly have as much time as, as anybody would like if you do have a question. 
Uh, you can raise your hand in the participant window or post your question in Q&A or post it in the chat. Um, but we're here to, to spend as much time as needed to um, answer any questions you have. Uh, we may also do another uh, webinar like this in January, um, perhaps a little bit slightly different, but covering any new topics that have come up. Of course, this is a bunch of rowers, so we're all we're not we're, we're getting close to our bedtimes here. Yeah. Yes. So. Uh, Jackie says, thank you. And Richard says, thank you. Great job getting a lot of info across at just the right level of detail. You can read the chat just as well as I can. <laughs> well, thanks for, thanks for uh, coming in to listen. That's, I appreciate it. It's, it's, I just wanted to keep, make sure everyone is up to date on, on where we are with everything. Oh, so the question is, is there going to be, can we do barbecues next summer? <laughs> I'm hoping so. Like, I'm not going to guarantee it, but, uh, you know, it depends on how fast everyone gets vaccinated, how, 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 how much the transmission rate goes down, that kind of a thing. Um, certainly a lot like, like, more likely than it would have been this year <laughs> to have it. All right, everybody. Uh, Wayne, thank you very much for your expertise and your time and putting together the slides. Uh, it's much appreciated. Um, this was recorded and I'll be working to put it someplace where we can, uh, others who could not attend tonight could review it at their leisure. All right. So with um, no more questions, I think we'll call this an evening. Thank you all again. All right. Thanks a lot.